This quote uh, has been up there before, but I thought uh, it's, it's worth pushing the quote. Um, my background, I used to be the exploration manager for Rio Tinto Iron Ore in the Hamsley Basin. And then after that, I was the global director of uh, business development for Rio Tinto Iron Ore. So when I know when Rio Tinto comes out with something like this statement, um, they're not talking about uh, their innate feeling that they are uh, speaking to their, uh, to their shareholders. They're actually talking about an industry that they want to uh, tell the public about, an industry that's going to be very, very stable and in, uh, in high demand for the next uh, 30 to 40 years easily. It will outlast most of the people in this room and, of course, there will be uh, ups and downs but the iron ore industry will be an iron ore industry in demand for uh, a number of decades to come, uh, in spite of what, uh, whatever else you might hear. Royal resources. Uh, we have uh, uh, assets in uranium in, in the USA, uranium in the Northern Territory, iron ore, some iron ore in Western Australia. But uh, when I left Rio Tinto, um, and I looked at a number of iron ore deposits around the world and uh, tried to uh, envisage which one will be right for a small emerging company like, uh, like Royal Resources. Um, I decided to keep away from all the, all the countries where people are still eating each other, keep away from all the countries where you need a soup bag to carry around your, your daily, daily wage, and uh, stuck to Australia and, um, and decided that Razorback was, was the way to go. OK, a quick snapshot of Royal Resources. Um, Nothing terribly interesting there, apart that we're pretty cashed up, uh, market cap of about 50 million. We actually raised uh, about $7 million uh, last month in, in the deepest gloom of the market correction last month. Uh, we raised uh, $7 million at 18 cents when our shares were trading at 15 and a half cents. The way we did that is we got out of this country into uh, London, where people understand the value of iron ore, and people were truly willing to, uh, to buy this story, and I think they've bought extremely well. OK, Razorback is a magnetite. It's a low-grade magnetite. Um, you've heard a couple of speakers now about uh, DSO hematite. So let me just tell you a little bit about magnetite. First of all, the big question, why magnetite? OK, this, uh, this graph here is produced by Platts. It's a, it's a little bit old, but it doesn't really matter because it's a differential graph. And it shows the price of uh, iron ore as a function of, uh, of iron grade. Um, and uh, at about 62% uh, uh, FE, which is the, the reference fines for hematite, we have 100% 100 of, uh, of the price, the current spot price. The current spot price is about $180 a tonne uh, at 62%. Below that, we've got the cheaper material at around 58, 57 per cent, uh, which is the channel iron deposits. And, um, and they get a bit of a, a, um, a hit on the price because they've got a lot of deleterious elements in them, mainly alumina, but also a lot of uh, molecular bound water. Um, as we go up the curve to the very high grade deposits, first we have a next area up here of, uh, of lump. That's the, the larger size uh, iron ore that usually comes at about at about 65, 66% FE. Um, and then right up the top here, at the top of this graph, uh, there are only two commodities that occupy that space. One are the ultra high grades that come out of Brazil, about 68% FE, these are hematites, and the other ones are magnetites. And why magnetites? Because magnetite concentrate is a man made product. So you can actually dial up exactly what chemistry you want if you've got a nice deposit. And why is that important? Well, as, as I said, you've heard a few things about uh, some of the hematite producers um, earlier in the evening. And, and they're doing a very, very nice business, thank you very much. But as more and more of those juniors come on the market and put more and more low-grade hematites into China's and Japan's and Taiwan's and Korea's um, uh, blast furnaces, they're actually loading up those blast furnaces with more and more alumina and more and more phosphorus. And there only, there's only one real way you can deal with that economically, and that is to buy very, very high-grade material to sweeten your blend. And because magnetite, being a man-made concentrate, uh, has got very low levels of alumina and very low levels of phosphorus, in, in fact, in many cases, almost none, 
This is the ideal product. Okay, and what that means is that, uh, what that translates to is a, is a premium. And that's, that's where you see the premium. The current premium is around $5 per FE percent per tonne over the reference fines. Now, if you're producing a 68% magnetite concentrate, that's 6% over the reference fines, that's a $30 premium you're attracting. Now, that's a very significant premium because, first of all, the big producers in Australia, like uh, BHP and Rio Tinto, are currently producing at about 20 or 25 bucks a tonne. The second thing that's very important about that $30 premium is that beneficiation costs are re currently running at about $30 to $40 a tonne. So what that premium is telling you is that uh, in producing a high-grade magnetite, you've actually, paid for the you've actually paid for your concentration costs straight up. So there is, no, there is absolutely no disadvantage in producing magnetite uh, compared to hematite, apart from the business risk of having to put in a large cost beneficiation plant. And you can't get away from that. Okay, you've seen uh, in, the, in the newspapers lately, uh, long-run average analyst pricing is increasing $100 a tonne. What does that mean? That's, that means when, when, when the, the iron ore price is expected to correct uh, in, the, in the future, and that future is getting further and further out as we go, uh, we'll, we'll go from the 180 odd dollar spot market that we're seeing now back down to about $100. And that $100 is set very, very logically. It's actually set at the domestic cost of iron ore production in China. The, uh, the Chinese need about uh, 900 million tonnes, they produce about 300 million tonnes and import about 600 million tonnes. As soon as the iron ore price falls below 100 US dollars a tonne, we're getting a massive um, des desertion of the iron market in China. We saw that at the start of 2009 when the reference price, um, we were still doing reference pricing back then, was about 120 bucks a tonne. The GFC struck early 2009, the iron ore price collapsed, collapsed to about 65 bucks a tonne. Suddenly nobody wanted to take their shipments of long-term contracts. It didn't stay there that long, and it didn't stay that, there that long for a very, very good reason. And that is because all the entrepreneurs in China suddenly went off and, and dealt with real estate, making plastic uh, Barbie dolls or flat screen TVs, and the Chinese iron ore production plummeted. And in reaction to that, a month or two later, the iron price shot back up past the $120 reference price that had been in place, and then just kept on going north to about $160, $170 a tonne. So that $100 um, floor on the, um, on, on the iron ore price is a very, very real floor. OK, um, a few quotes there um, uh, from people like uh, Merrill Lynch. They put the price at $141 US dollars a tonne. Uh, my experience is, more, is lower than that, but it is increasing. And it's increasing for a very good reason. China's got huge inflation. But on top of that, it's, it has to have an appreciating currency. So uh, the forex inflation uh, impact on, on iron ore, domestic iron ore production will hit very, very hard and, and very, very soon. OK, Razorback project. Let's get back to, uh, to some, uh, some uh, geology and uh, some uh, resource economics. We've got 100% ownership, um, up to 8 billion tonnes of uh, exploration target. Um, why, do, why did we choose this? And that, we chose it for its location first and foremost. A bulk commodity like iron ore, um, like coal, like bauxite, and to some extent potash, is a logistics problem. You, you're producing millions of tonnes and you've got to shift millions of tonnes. If you don't have access to infrastructure, you are shot. And that's why about three quarters of the junior wannabes in, in the Pilbara and the, middle, and the Midwest are just sitting there hoping for the fairy godmother to come along and give them access to rail. Well, it ain't going to happen, or it isn't, certainly isn't going to happen that quickly. We, however, have got a government railway sitting within 40 kilometres of us. That's the Sydney to Perth uh, Indian Pacific Railway. But that bit of railway here is actually very, very important. It comes from... Um, uh, just over here is uh, the old mining town of Broken Hill, and that bit of rail there is a heavy gauge ore carrying rail. It's where, it's where uh, electrolytic zinc, North Limited, and way before that, BHP, shipped their lead and zinc concentrates down to Port Perry. 
So we've got a heavy gauge railway, it's an ore carrying railway. The rest of the railway, by the way, is just normal general mercantile railway for passengers and, and general transport. Um, heading straight to a port. It's in a very infrastructure rich area, and I'll show you some of that. We've got over 1,400 uh, square kilometres of ground. Uh, as I said, an 8 billion tonne exploration potential. Um, the, the ore is extremely soft. This is not a banded iron formation, which is the classic source of magnetites in Australia. And in doing all this, we're actually defining a new emerging iron ore province uh, in, in Australia. Okay, this is what it looks like. That's Razorback Ridge. Um, there's a lot of stuff on this, on this slide. Let, let me just go through it. But that's Razorback Ridge. And that, and that slick bit of black coming down the hill there is the ore body. And there are not many places in Australia where you can actually still see an outcropping ore, ore body like that. And you can see little, little uh, buff bits area on, on, on the slopes here. That's our, our, our drill sites. That is continuous iron ore all the way here through this valley and, uh, and where the, uh, uh, from where the f photograph was taken. This is where we, uh, we're standing. This is, uh, we're standing on Iron Peak out here. That's, uh, this, this image here is the aeromagnetic image. It shows you where all the magnetite is. All that electric white and blue is, is uh, high in, in, in magnetite. That photograph is taken from that little peak there, looking across to Razorback Ridge here. We have got over 110 strike kilometres of host rock. This is the exploration target model. It's a very sophisticated uh, magnetic modelling package um, uh, that has been married with geological information. This is the area that I'll be talking about, the Razorback Ridge area for our uh, maiden resource. But you can see this, this area here is just this little area in here. We've got a hell of a lot more to, uh, to explore. Okay, we're zooming in on Razorback Ridge itself. Um, we've uh, tested about 5% uh, of our strike length that we've got available to us. That's about five kilometres. And we're getting a little bit over 100 uh, million tonnes of resource per kilometre. Um, the, the maiden resource came out nine months after we picked up this project. Uh, that was about 277 million tonnes. Um, and then we increased that, uh, that inferred resource um, less than eight months later to the current 569 million tonnes. This is what it looks like. Very, very simple, boring ore body. Mining engineers love boring ore bodies. They don't like things that move around. They like really boring stuff. That's why coal miners are such boring people. But the, it's got very, very simple, regular outcropping geology, very consistent mineralization. But what we've also done in, in increasing the, uh, the inferred resource from the, uh, the, our maiden 277 million tonnes to 569 million tonnes is because this ore body is so consistent, we, we are actually able to put 437-odd million tonnes of that directly into indicated resource. And we are actually the first uh, magnetite uh, explorer in that part of the world that actually has got an, uh, an indicated resource. And we will be converting the remaining 132 million tonnes of that inferred resource into, um, uh, into an indicated resource over the next, um, the next uh, drilling campaign. I'll turn this thing off. Okay, it, this will produce a very, very clean, very, very high value concentrate. I don't want to get too technical here, but the, uh, these are the head grades up the top. It's not particularly high grade. Most banded iron formations usually go about 30 to 35% FE. We are typically around uh, the mid 20s to, to slightly higher, so it's not a particularly high grade ore body. You can see that in the, in the, in the ROM ore, the stuff that the, 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 the you dig out of the ground, very high in alumina, very high in phosphorus. But as soon as you crush it and grind it, and pass it through a magnetic separator, you start producing a concentrate that uh, escalates in FE very, very quickly with size. So this is, this is grinding size. Um, uh, 75 microns is 0.075 millimetres, just in case uh, some of the people here don't know what that is. So it's pretty fine stuff, but you're producing a 68% product, uh, FE product, very quickly. Uh, the phosphorus is almost non-existent, the alumina is almost non-existent, so this will be a very, very good sweetening product into a blast furnace that's using lower grade, cheaper uh, DSO hematite ores. Okay, one of the other great aspects of, uh, of this particular material is that it's very soft. 
Banded iron formation has got a very crystalline structure. That's what it looks like. I don't want to bore you with too much technology stuff, but it's pretty self-apparent. This is, this, is, this is very tightly bound crystals. You need a lot of energy to actually break that up and to grind it up into, into a powder. Uh, and that material typically takes about uh, 20 kilowatt hours per tonne to, uh, to crush and grind. Our material is more like a, a, a magnetite siltstone. Very, very soft. You hit it with a hammer and just, it just shatters. And that translates to, to less than 10 kilowatt hours per tonne. And what, you don't, what you really need to understand about uh, this, this power usage is that in beneficiation costs, about 60% uh, of your costs are dictated by your power costs. So if you can have a, um, a magnetite source which uses 50% less power than your peers, then you've got a very, very good lever to producing a low cost concentrate compared to your peers. OK, we've got multiple options for transport to coast. Um, the, uh, as I've already said, uh, we've got a heavy gauge railway, it's available. We've got MOUs with uh, that, that railway, the, what they call the below rail uh, operation, is owned by the federal government. It's a government owned rail, Australian Rail Track Corporation. The above rail operation is, uh, can be done by anybody. Uh, people like Asiano through Pacific National do it, uh, Genesee and Wyoming do it, Sh specialised bulk rail do it. Um, but there are a number of above rail operators. We can put in uh, uh, 10 to 12 million tonnes per annum on that rail straight away without any other changes to the rail. It has very, very low cartage costs compared to places like uh, the Pilbara and, and the Midwest. Um, certainly not um, compared to the Rio Tinto and BHPs in this, of this world that actually operate their own rail. Those, those rail costs are extremely low. But people like MGX uh, at Mount Gibson are, uh, are paying, at about, uh, paying about $18 a tonne to get their material from Tellering Peak, for example, to, uh, to Geraldton. Uh, the uh, Okiji Rail and Port uh, development, uh, the guys there will be paying about 22 bucks a tonne to get that uh, material to rail. We'll be paying below $6 a tonne to get this stuff to the coast. Um, our other option, of course, is a uh, slurry pipeline. Every magnetite talks about a slurry pipeline. That's because the stuff is so fine, you can just mix it with water and pump it to the coast. That's a higher capex uh, opportunity for us, but a, a, a very much lower OPEX. It's about a third of the price in OPEX. So when we get to the bankable feasibility study stage, uh, it's one of those games we'll play about how much capex you, you, you spend up front, depending on how much OPEX you want to spend. Um, OK, we have uh, multiple options for uh, export facilities. Um, the obvious port is Port Piri. Once again, not a very good port. It's, a, it's what's called a river port. It's on an estuarine. It only takes handy max uh, size vessels. So if we were to use Port Piri, we would have to transship out into the middle of the Gulf here. That's no big problem. One still transships out of Wyala, which is about here. Um, Canadian shipping lines do that for us. For, for, for uh, one still at about $5 a tonne. So it's not a particularly big impost. The, uh, the other options are, um, oh, sorry, Port Benighton here actually doesn't exist. That's, um, that's a, a glint in the, in the eye of the South Australian government. It's like an o the Okergy Port development in Western Australia. I doubt that it'll be in, in place by the time we need it, so we're not really thinking about that in any sort of serious way. But the other, the other very low cost option that we're looking at is uh, what's called direct slurry loading onto a floating stockpile. That is getting the material to the coast, and uh, getting it from the coast onto the vessel, on, onto a vessel, using a slurry pipeline. That, that dark blue there is the, um, uh, is the cape size capable uh, depth in, in the Gulf. Uh, and there are a number of places here where we're actually very close uh, to, those, to those depths, and we're looking at that right now. Um, Look, slurry loading onto a floating stockpile is, is, is used in a number of places. It's been mostly used in, in uh, coal exporting around the world. There are, there are probably about a dozen or so ports uh, uh, around the world that use slurry pipelining on, onto ships, mainly for coal. Uh, there is, um, the closest one to, to Australia is a, um, is a, a magnetite sands loading facility uh, at Tauroa Sands on the North Island of New Zealand. And that's what theirs looks like. 
Um, that facility is, uh, it costs less than $20 million. In our case, we would, uh, we would pump onto a permanently moored cape-sized vessel, do the dewatering on that vessel, use that vessel as a, as a floating stockpile, and, uh, and then simply uh, transfer the cargo uh, to the transport vessel at sea. This would uh, save us um, any requirements in, in terms of, uh, of putting in stockpiles, uh, of putting in uh, reclaimers, uh, of, of a whole bunch of work that you need to do when you're dealing with, uh, with dry product. Okay, we have multiple options for power, water and accommodation. I mean, some people think these are trivial, but if you're, if you're uh, trying to set up a mine in the middle of the Pilbara, it's going to cost you something like uh, one or two hundred million dollars just putting in the, an accommodation village. We're in the middle of some, some very, very uh, infrastructure rich country. We've got the Cooper Basin to Adelaide natural gas pipeline uh, coming to within 50 kilometres of the project. Um, so we've got an ability to actually uh, generate our own power much cheaply than the grid. Uh, we've also uh, 50 kilometres from, from the state grid. It's uh, uh, Port Augusta, South Australia's major uh, conventional thermal power station. Uh, so that's, that's a possibility as well. Uh, we're on the edge of the, of, of the Murray Basin, so even this area is, is quite dry. There, there's very little water around. Uh, there's a lot of water in the, um, as groundwater in, in, in the Murray Basin, so we'll be able to get that. Um, as I say, a number of mining, number of towns around here, a number of those towns are mining towns, uh, Broken Hill, Burra. Uh, a number of those towns are very heavy engineering towns. Peterborough is a, is a railway town. And then we have the steelworks at Wyala, um, uh, power generation at Port Augusta, etc. So this is not a situation where we have to fly in, fly out people. This is not a situation where we have to build an accommodation village. This is a situation where we will probably bus, bus people in and out or they can drive themselves. OK, and it's likely to be a low-cost producer. Um, this, this, this stuff is outcropping. Here it is on the ridge here. It'll have a zero stripping ratio for the first two or three years, and that's really nice because the first two or three years is how we pay off our, um, our capital. Um, the, the stripping ratio increases after that, of course, but we've already paid off our capital, so that's OK. Um, as I say, it's very, it, it's very geologically and mineralogically uh, simple and consistent, so it's a very easy thing to... Uh, your your, your, sh your short-term mine plan and your long-term mine plan will be essentially the same, so there'll be very little money uh, wasted on that. And uh, the soft ore suggests, although we haven't tested it yet, suggests it will be amenable to continuous surface miners, which means we won't have to do conventional drill and blast, which will save a hell of a lot more money as well. Okay, now um, a lot of people ask me that, uh, you know, it's just a low-grade uh, uh, low magnetite. Um, it's, um, it, it doesn't particularly uh, doesn't particularly have a high um, recovery rate. That is, how many how many how many tons of uh, how many tons of ore uh, converts to how many tons of uh, of product. But if we, uh, I won't, uh, if you, um, I won't go through this, uh, this table. I've, I've got plenty of um, uh, printouts of this presentation uh, with my colleague over there if you're interested. But compared to the conventional Australian banded iron formation, I'm talking about uh, City Pacific's uh, project up at the Sino project in the Pilbara, and I'm talking about the Carrara project that Jindalbi are, are currently getting into production with Anstil. Uh, their numbers are very, very similar to this. They have higher grades. Uh, they have better weight recovery. Oh, sorry, better weight recoveries. Um, but even so, even with those uh, those apparent advantages of higher grades and better weight recoveries, uh, the Razorback project is actually up to thirty dollars uh, better off than uh, than those projects. So this is a very, very robust project. OK, there's very low environmental risk. This is, uh, you know, to coin a, a phrase you've heard in, in, in another context, this is clapped out sheep country. It's, 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 it's very, very poor country. Um, that, by the way, is there's an additive to this. The, the government uh, uh, dug a, a tunnel into the hill in the late 60s when it was the first and last time it was looked at. And that blue stuff there is all ore. It's, uh, and that additive is a very, very beautiful thing to have uh, on our site. Um, we have uh, native title agreements in place. Um, our property, by the way, is, um, is split in half, about half. The, the western half is not subject to native title at all. 
native title has been extinguished on that side. On the, on the, uh, on the eastern side, we have, uh, it is subject to native title, but we've got a native title agreement in place with, with the, local, uh, the local tribe. Okay, scoping study financials show extremely, uh, extremely attractive uh, NPVs and internal rates of return, even with relatively low iron ore pricing. Um, we believe we can get the capex lower than this and the opex lower than that. That 10 million tonne per annum uh, capex has not got the economies of scale that you'd expect. It's actually based on four two and a half million tonne per annum units. Um, so we think we can get that a lot lower. There are very, very few uh, magnetite operations or, or projects around the world that can produce uh, 10 to 12 million tonnes per annum at, at that, sort of, uh, that sort of capex. Okay, and that's our, uh, our schedule. Very, very aggressive. Um, we've, um, we'll be uh, defining uh, a billion tonnes by the end of this year. Uh, our pre-feasibility study is underway this year and that's due to be uh, delivered by the end of this year. We'll go into a bankable feasibility study or definitive feasibility study for most of next year and then um, to project financing and a project start-up by the start of 2013. Um, Royal resources is exceptional value on, uh, value on a comparable sales basis. This is not the way people normally see things, but I look at all the projects that have been sold rather than the value on the market. And uh, that's where Royal sits on a uh, per tonne uh, valuation if you convert every, all these resources to 100% FE to get rid of the, uh, the grade problem. So we're sitting very, very low on, uh, on that valuation uh, graph. And that's where you can find us. So uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, shoot. Managing Director of Royal Resources, Marcus Fliss.